Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Tammy Doerr, President and CEO of the Downtown Denver Partnership and co-chair of Denver Startup Week. This year marks the 10-year anniversary of Denver Startup Week. DSW has been the catalyst for lots of change over the past decade. And this week, we're coming together to celebrate the past and dream big for the future. We are able to bring Denver Startup Week to this community thanks to our 2021 sponsors. Thank you to our HQ and title sponsor, Amazon, and our title sponsors whose leadership makes this week come to life. Capital One Cafe, Downtown Denver Partnership, Fluid Truck, Hotel Engine, and WeWork, and our track sponsors who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible, our founder track sponsor, Kickstart, growth track sponsor, Friday Health Plans, developer track sponsor, Quizlet, product track sponsor, Palantir, our designer track sponsor, Battery 621, and The Public Works. People track sponsor, Exactly, and Spotlight event sponsor, Strat Labs. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement to the week. Thank you to B-Side Fund, Colorado Public Radio, Comcast, Coors Brewing, Denver Pavilions, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver, J.P. Morgan Chase, Method, Moss Adams, Pi Insurance, Promontory Mortgage, Path, Southwest, Tattered Cover, and VF Venture Foundry. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors, all listed on the screen. Please say thank you to these companies as you enjoy our hybrid Denver Startup Week. And don't forget, use the hashtag Den Startup Week to share your experiences and moments of inspiration on social media. Have a great week. Hello, I'm Sal Gentili, CEO of Friday Health Plans and we're proud to sponsor the growth track this year at Denver Startup Week. We're a company that just entered a rapid growth phase, so we felt it was particularly appropriate. When my business partner and I started Friday Health Plans five years ago, we knew we wanted to create a company that catered to people who bought their own health insurance. The Affordable Care Act was just getting going, and we saw an opportunity to serve a brand new market of health insurance consumers. Independent consultants, startup groups, gig workers, service industry workers, designers, creators, and other independent professionals, like many of you here today. We knew that if we built a health plan that was simple to buy, easy to use, had great customer service, and most of all was affordable, we could compete against the big insurance plans who only focus on serving big companies. After spending five years getting into the Colorado market and completing a successful proof of concept, we successfully closed a $50 million round of growth funding earlier this year. We're now about to expand to three additional states later this year, hire more than 400 employees to support our growth, and eventually be in more than 10 states by 2025. I wish each of you good luck in your startup and growth pursuits. And as you think about your upcoming health insurance needs, I hope you consider fellow growing startup Friday Health Plans. Open enrollment starts November 1st. Check us out at FridayHealthPlans.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Jake Cohen, the Growth Track Chair and member of the Denver Startup Week Organizing Committee. Thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary of Denver Startup Week. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow. Regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, or sexual orientation. A special thank you to our sponsors for their support in helping us to keep Denver Startup Week free and accessible for all. Thank you for joining us and have a great week. All right, Zach, I'll let you take it away. Cool, thanks, Ashley. Uh, thanks, Jake, and the entire team for making this happen. Um, let's just start off by making sure I share the right screen and uh, we can start off on a good foot here. Let's see, right, okay. Sweet, and you know what? I'm gonna do this without the glasses, so if anything goes wrong, we can, uh, 
blame it on me not being able to see anything. Sweet. All right. Thank you to everyone for coming out or um, as is more likely the case, staying home and logging on. Um, I'm super excited to be here because I have had a lot of fun at Denver Startup Week events in the past. Um, but this is my first time speaking. And so I'm just stoked to share this message with you. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to raise awareness for your nonprofit or your social enterprise by clarifying your message. And um, of course, I'm going to get into what that means, what that entails, why that's important. Um, but the first thing I want to say is just so that we're on the same page, I'm going to be offering a lot of information, um, a lot of training here in just a little bit of time. And so my only ask of you is that if you're here, uh, please be present. Try not to multitask as much as you can. Um, you know, I know lots of other things are coming up. Listen, I get it. But this is one of the best uses of your time. Um, I truly believe that with all my heart or I wouldn't be here. And I think that more than that, your time and your attention um, is a gift to me. So I want to make sure that you get it back tenfold with the time that this will save you in your business and the money that this is going to make you. Um, so let's get a lay of the land first and some context around why we're here. Um, the first thing I want to say is that if you're coming from the nonprofit, the nonprofit realm, most nonprofit leaders struggle to raise awareness for the organization. And I know this because I talk to nonprofit EDs all day on most days. Um, so if you are feeling like, you know, you have inherited a director position or however you got involved in your nonprofit and um, you're thinking about how do we grow our visibility? Right? How do we grow our nonprofit by getting more people to know about us? You're not alone. If you're coming from the more entrepreneurial route, most entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs or otherwise, most entrepreneurs struggle with growing and sustaining their revenue. Listen, I know firsthand, it is really hard to get a business off the ground. Um, it's hard to start making money and then it's hard to keep that money. And when you're on a path to growth, it's hard to um, protect that and keep that safe and sustain that. So if you're an entrepreneur struggling with that, you're not alone either. And regardless of your position and your job and your work and your life, whatever, I, I really do think that most of us are completely winging it. Maybe there's a few like elite people in the world um, that have like one or two things figured out, but most of us are completely winging it. And the point I want to drive home is that if you're a social entrepreneur, if you're a nonprofit ED, uh, maybe you even work in development, you work in advancement, I mean, you might be like a CMO or a director of marketing, but you still find yourself thinking, how do I get people to know that we exist? What am I supposed to say when someone asks what we do? How do I get this vision out into the world so that we can really make the difference that we're called to make? Um, you are not alone. In fact, you're in the majority. My hypothesis for this is that it's kind of like the passion let us here thing rather than a traditional job route. Um, and because we tend to get involved in causes that we care about, we might be faced with tasks and responsibilities in the job itself that we have no idea how to do uh, or that we just have a limited experience in. That's okay, because crafting a clear and compelling message is something anyone can do to start seeing immediate results in your business or organization. That's what I'm going to be covering today. So you might say, Zach, that sounds great, but why, why is this really one of the best uses of my time? Why do I believe that? Um, there's, really, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but I think there's three main reasons for this. The first is that everything you do in your business or nonprofit is a projection of your message. That includes your website your social media, uh, when you're pitching investors or looking for sponsorships, when you're running donation campaigns, I don't mean to freak anybody out, but Colorado Gives Day is right around the corner. Uh, when you're going through product development or figuring out how to position that in the market. And of course, my favorite, when you're in the back of an Uber, uh, this hasn't happened in a while, has it? But when you're in the back of an Uber and someone says, what do you do? I mean, how many of us start with, oh, I do a lot of things. It's hard to say, but like, ah, it's complicated or you know, like the worst, I'm an entrepreneur, or I'm a consultant. Oh my God, don't get me started on that one. Uh, we wanna have a, just a clear way of getting people to lean in and listen and say, tell me more. Messaging is my favorite topic because it's such a quick and easy fix that applies to everything that you're doing in your marketing and sales. Um, and then if you do it right, you're gonna be ahead of the pack because so many people are too focused on the marketing tactics, the blog posts, the social media posts, the Facebook ads, SEO, whatever else that they can't see the real issue underneath is that you have got to invite your customers, your clients, your donors into a story where they can be the hero. I'm gonna talk obviously a bit more about that as we go along. 
The second reason this is important is because having a clear message gives you clarity and focus during a pivot. Um, and this became really apparent last year during COVID. And I think as we exit COVID and we're still navigating what a post-COVID world might look like, if it ever gets here, um, I think this is going to be, you know, continuing to become more and more important. What I mean by this is that having a clear message allows you to like see your business, like to break down the parts of your business and see that more clearly, if that makes sense, and to see how you fit in the marketplace. So your core message comes down to who do you serve? What problem do you solve? How does it make people's lives better? And what do they need to do to get it or to get involved? And so when you're doing a pivot, it usually addresses one of these questions. For instance, your market is just answering the question differently. Who are we serving? Maybe you have the same business model, you even have the same solution, but you're just serving a different market now. Maybe you're serving the same people, but you're solving a different problem that they have, right? That's a niche question. So um, you could be serving one group of people um, and that didn't change, but what you're doing and the problem you're addressing within that group, that might be different. That's a form of pivoting. Of course, your solution itself, the product, the service, the program, the offer, uh, this is a way of answering the question, how does it make people's lives better? How, how do we solve that problem? So maybe you're serving the same person, um, you're, you're solving the same problem that they have, but the way that you tackle it is different. And then of course your delivery channel, what do people need to do to get it or to get involved? I think the obvious example here is that to eat at a restaurant, you used to have to walk in, now you gotta call and take it out. Um, obviously not true for all restaurants, but I think that all of our businesses at some time or another, whether it's because of COVID or something else, um, have to endure some sort of transition where we're finding our place in the market and having a clear message allows you to break down these parts really clearly. The third and final reason is something that I think is less obvious, but I tend to see it be the most impactful when I work with people, especially teams. And that's uh, having a clear message allows you to align your team and yourself under a common vision. When everyone understands what you're working towards, they're gonna to understand why their role is important. So first of all, this can help in recruiting efforts. I know we're all kind of like hiring uh, in a little bit of a hiring blitz right now. This will help with your recruiting efforts too. Uh, that's a topic for a different, a different day, frankly, a different person. Um, but you're able to show up with a lot more conviction when you know where the ship is headed, right? Okay. Um, I just want to give you a quick story to demonstrate the power of this. This is with a nonprofit social enterprise I worked with called Glittercat. I love talking uh, about them because what nonprofit names themselves Glittercat? Clearly my kind of people. Um, but when we started working together, they were, I think, just over two years old. And their co-founders had no background in nonprofits, entrepreneurship, marketing sales, none of that. Um, one of their co-founders had a long career in coffee education. And the other co-founder was a director of events for a really prominent coffee company in New York. If you're a New Yorker, you know Joe, Co Joe Coffee Company, all over the place. Um, they also had no website. They had no full-time staff. I mean, they were running this as a side hustle. They had a really loose sense of identity. Um, they were making an impact, but they weren't sure who they wanted to be going into the future. They weren't sure where they fit in. After working together, uh, they just closed a few weeks ago a multinational event that had over 4,000 people. I forget how many countries, but it was like countries all over the world. Um, and I remember being on the phone with Veronica, their, their chief glitter officer, and she said that their stretch goal was 2,000 people. And without even trying, just from implementing some of this stuff, um, they had over 4,000 people from all over the world. From launching one new product, it's a roaster spotlight. Um, it's kind of like a coffee subscription, but it features coffee roasters who hold uh, marginalized identities or come, who come from historically underrepresented backgrounds. Just from adding uh, about 75 boxes of these every month, they've added over $2,000 a month in earned sales revenue, and they're on their way to becoming a self-sufficient organization. They've been landing major sponsorships with huge brands like Pacific Foods and a lot of other industry giants. They have recurring donations coming in the door every single month simply by keeping up with their email, uh, their email list. They, I think this is really cool. They just launched an anti-racism hospitality overhaul. So I should have mentioned Glittercat, what they do um, is they promote diversity and accessibility in the hospitality industry, more or less. And so they launched this anti-racism hospitality overhaul um, where they go into businesses and they look at their, um, you know, their regulations and just their practices and the way they run their business and they make them more inclusive. Um, and I think 
their first cohort was free, but this has the potential to be a huge revenue driver um, in their organization. So I think that's so cool. And best of all, their executive director, the chief glitter officer was able to go full time. And now every day she gets to focus on um, how to grow this organization and make the impact that they feel called to make. They also have a full suite of volunteers under them who help them uh, on their Instagram with content, with emails, with all this kind of stuff. And so they're not relying on it alone. A clear message allowed them to get people on board who believe in that vision. I wanna emphasize all of this started our very first call together. All of this started by crafting a clear message about who they serve, the problem they solve, and how they make the world a better place. Here's a quick note about me. My name is Zach Tanasi Lenkel. It's, you pronounce it like it looks if you just look at it slowly. Um, as of seven days ago, my new home is Medellin, Colombia. But before that, I was in New York City, which is just about the coolest place in the whole wide world. I got my graduate degree from the University of Denver. And during that time, I was a Civico Social Enterprise Fellow with what is now the Barton Institute for Community Action. I'm the founder of Mission Driven Impact. We're a training and education company in the social impact space. And I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching for social enterprise founders. There are some logos with some, uh, some companies I've worked with in and beyond Denver. Hopefully you take me in my word that I know what I'm talking about. So before we dive in, uh, one thing you gotta do is download this worksheet. Highly recommended. First of all, this link is case sensitive. I'll give you a minute to do it, but um, if you don't, no worries. Or if you join in late, no worries. Um, we're going to be covering what's on that worksheet here today, but this is just a quick, you don't have to enter your email address or anything to get it. Just, it'll direct you to Google Drive um, or Google Docs rather, make a copy real quick and you can follow along at home. Uh, one other thing I want to say, just as I'm giving you like 10 more seconds to do this, if we don't finish the whole thing today, um, like I said, your time and attention is gift to me. So I would love, I've already connected with some of you on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message. I would love to, um, work with you to finish that for free, just to make sure that this is something you're happy with, something you can start to use right away. That is how much I believe in the power of what we're gonna be doing over the next few minutes um, and the power that I think that it can have in your business. Just send me a message on LinkedIn and I will send you my calendar link. Okay, hopefully that gave you enough time. So to give you um, a little overview of the points we're gonna be hitting today, we're gonna be using something called the Story Brand Framework and it's, uh, story Brand is this organization. It was built off of Donald Miller's best-selling book, Building a Story Brand. Um, great book, highly recommended. But um, they realized that this is the way all great speeches and stories have been told. In fact, if you think about the last great movie you saw, um, I'm not a big movie guy, but people keep telling me I need to go see Shang-Chi. Uh, anyway, I bet, I would bet like a thousand bucks that it follows this formula. Um, and if you look at great speeches from Steve Jobs, from Martin Luther King, um, just great books from throughout history, they all follow this format. It's a character, they want something, but they have a problem, right? Something's standing in their way. So they meet a God that understands their fear, that God gives them a plan, calls them to action. And when the hero takes that action, they avoid failure and they achieve success. So this is the story that we're going to be inviting our customers and clients and donors into as well. But the thing you've got to remember is that your customer, your client, your donor, they are the hero of the story. You are the guide, right? The story is not about you. We got, we got to get that straight right away. The story is not about you. You are there to facilitate a transformation. So your hero, your customer, client, your donor, they're Luke Skywalker, you're Yoda. They're Harry Potter your Dumbledore. And the crux to being a good guy, uh, we're going to talk about this again and, you know, in conversation, have follow up conversations with me or whatever. Uh, I talk about this all the time is that for any of this to work, that this, like, I want to be clear, this will not work if you do not show up with empathy. Empathy is how you become a great guy. So right now, what I want you to do, if you're following along at home or you're watching this at a later date, I want you to just, in your mind or even out loud, raise your hand, talk to your dog, whatever. I want you to make a commitment that what we're going to be doing before we do anything else is listening to the people that we serve. We're going to be showing up. We're going to be listening. We're going to show up with a heart of service. We're going to be striving to understand. We're going to be showing up with empathy. This will not work. And it's my own personal and professional belief that your business will not work either at all or for long if you don't show up with empathy. That's the most important part. If you don't take anything else away from our conversation today, that's gotta be it. Okay, the thing that holds the story together 
is the transformation, right? Every character goes through a great transformation. Luke Skywalker's got to grow up before he saves the world. Uh, same thing with Harry Potter. Um, I'm not a big movie guy. I always try to come up with these movie analogies and I think, oh, I don't even watch movies. Um, but when you think about a great book or whatever, character always goes through some sort of transformation in order to get where they want to go. So I like to draw just a quick before and after, uh, kind of before we get started with the framework. First, how would you describe your character? That is your ideal customer, your ideal client, your ideal donor. How would you describe them before they engage with you? You know, how do they feel? What are they struggling with? What's their day-to-day -day like? I like to just draw out a few words, you know, uh, one word with a comma. Uh, maybe they're feeling frustrated. They're feeling overwhelmed. Um, maybe they're tired. Uh, maybe they're feeling guilty. Maybe they're feeling uh, sad that their relationship isn't working. Maybe they are feeling discouraged because they can't lose that last 20 pounds. Uh, maybe they are feeling alone, uh, like they don't have access to something. It can be anything, right? How would you describe them before they engage with you? After they buy or after they donate, how do they feel? I always say, why is someone going to give you money and say, thank you? How do they feel? How would they want to be described? How would they describe themselves? And most importantly, who do they want to become? We're reaching into the level of identity here. So before, um, someone might be feeling, uh, you know, let's say I'm a personal trainer, someone might be feeling discouraged because they just can't lose that last 20 pounds, that last little bit of belly fat. Um, and it's making them feel inadequate and like a failure and, uh, you know, body shame and all this nasty stuff that comes with that. Well, after, right, I'm not going to sell you a workout plan. What I'm going to tell you about is afterward, you're going to feel empowered. You're going to feel sexy. You're going to want every, you're going to find every excuse you can to go on date night with your significant other, right? Um, you're going to just light up with a whole new joy. That's the transformation we're seeking. Okay. Um, let's dive into the seven points of the framework. Um, I want to hopefully get this done quickly and then we have a lot of time for Q&A um, or a follow-up conversations. Again, you're always welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay, so chapter one is pretty straightforward. What does our character want? Um, our ideal customer, our ideal client, our ideal donor, what is it that they're looking to achieve? What's the end result? Um, I just fill in the blank here. My ideal customer, client, donor wants blank. Now, I was giving an example uh, to one of my clients earlier in the week. I had a little Bluetooth speaker on my desk and I said, uh, you know, this kind of, we could think about this at three levels. A surface level marketer might try to sell me a speaker. I mean, it's a great speaker. It's black, uh, it, it's waterproof. You know, it's just, it's a nice speaker all around. Uh, you can drop it and it probably won't break. If you go up a level from that, and the truth is when I got the speaker, I wasn't looking for a speaker, right? A level up from that, someone might be trying to sell me, you know, the benefit, not just the feature. It's the great sound, right? That boom and bass, you know, you know I mean, it's like, a, it's a great device. Uh, for filling the whole room when you're entertaining a party or something like that. Um, you know, Bluetooth means you don't have to plug anything in. And so if you're, uh, you know, like me and, and have a habit of tripping over cords whenever they are around, you know, you don't got to worry about that. So that's a step up. You say, okay. But the really savvy marketer knows exactly what I want. If I'm in their target market, they're going to say something like, listen, whether it's a speaker or, you know, the voice of God, like it doesn't even matter what the device is. What it's going to do is when you're having a bad day, you can take this Bluetooth waterproof speaker into the shower and you can sing and dance your heart out. So the savvy marketer is selling me the antidote to a bad day. How much different is that from would you like to buy the speaker, right? And the truth is that applies to all of our businesses, whether we have a product-based business, a service-based business, um, if we're a nonprofit donation-based organization, right? People want something deep. So look, you spend some time looking beyond the immediate thing you're offering into the benefit. What is it they really want? Okay, so they want that thing, that's B. They're trying to get from A to B, but something is standing in their way. They got a problem. Otherwise, they would just be a B already, right? So what is standing in the way of your customer's transformation? The thing that you can point at and look at and name, that's the problem. That's something called the external problem. It's what we can see. It's what we can point at. But we know that people make decisions based on emotions. People donate based on the way that we're able to connect with them. Um, it's said often that people make decisions based on emotions and justify it based on logic. 
right? And so we really want to get to the internal problem. Right? We're peeling back the layers of the problem. How does it make them feel to have that problem? Maybe my problem is I've got some stubborn belly fat. How does that make me feel? It kind of makes me feel inadequate. And when I look in the mirror, honestly, I feel kind of ugly. You know, that's very different than if you're trying to uh, sell me lose the last 20 pounds versus if you're trying to sell me a resolution to those pain points. I can't drive this home enough that people make decisions based on emotions. And so that the more that we can tap into this and tell people we're not exploiting negative emotions here, right? We're not trying to push people's buttons. We're just trying to say, hey, we get it. Like we want people to raise their hand and say, oof, like you got me. You know exactly what I'm feeling. Now I'm listening, right? That's the, that's the energy uh, we want to show up with. I like to peel the peel the onion layers back, uh, even even another layer, and reach for a philosophical problem. Why is it just plain wrong for people to be burdened by this problem? Why is it not fair? One of my favorite examples of this was a um, I think they were like a motor scooter company in New York, and the external problem was sitting in traffic. Right? If you you know I live in downtown Manhattan, traffic is crazy. Um, that's like a problem. But the internal problem is how do you feel when you're sitting there? Maybe I feel guilty uh, because I can't make it home in time to have dinner with my kids. I never get to see them. Or um, I am in love with my beautiful partner, but it just sucks we can't spend a lot of time together because I've got a 90 minute commute <laughs> throughout the city. Then when I was on their website, the philosophical problem, uh, just right away, the big headline said, life's too short to sit in traffic. All right. It's not fair for if, if we're serving that market, it's not fair for them to be sitting in traffic. Life's just too short for that. Go do something better. Go spend time with your family. Go do things that light you up. I just can almost guarantee you sitting in downtown Manhattan traffic does not bring you a lot of joy. Right. That's the philosophical problem. And then if you can wrap it up into a root cause, um, see if your story has a villain. Things work really well. Um, when you can almost like rally against something. Again, we don't want to show up with this energy of like negativity or anything like that. Like we're just against everything. But if we can identify something as here's the vision of what we're working toward and there's something standing in the way and we're against that, right? We're against traffic. We are, I'm currently working with an organization in Denver uh, that provides racial equity and just DEI training. They have workshops and stuff. They're doing super cool work. Uh, but the villain of their story is systems of oppression. Like here are all the problems we're solving about isolation and not being able to not being able to bring your full self to work and having to trade the personal for the professional and things like that. All that is gone on its own, but when we can wrap it up and to say the root of this is historic systems of oppression, that's what we're fighting against, right? We can all rally around that cause. So the more you get to understand the problem, the more successful you're you're going to be in business. Um, the more you're going to be able to connect with people. So really worth taking some time um, here to think and reflect. Okay, our character wants something, something standing in the way. We show up as the guide. And the way we do that is one, by demonstrating empathy, two, by demonstrating authority. So what brief statement can you make that expresses empathy? That just says, hey, like we get it, we understand. But then on the flip side of that, we also need to say, not only do we understand your problem, but we are like basically competent enough uh, to be the ones to help you solve that problem. Right. Imagine if I showed up to a gym and I uh, saw a personal trainer and I was like, man, I need to lose that last 20 pounds. And they said, ah, me too. <laughs> you know, uh, but also imagine on the flip side, if, you know, it's totally jacked and ripped dude. And I was like, man, I want a six pack. And he said, um, well, maybe you should stop being so fat and lazy. Ooh, Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's not a lot of empathy there. That's not something that I personally resonate with. So you got to have both. We got to show that we understand, we care. We also have the ability to solve this problem. So just to get the creative juices flowing, I like to fill in the blank here. We understand how it feels to, like you were frustrated by, nobody should have to experience. So going back to the example of the um, racial equity organization I'm working with, we understand how it feels to um, be deal, you know, ha having to navigate these systems of oppression in your own life, but uh, then having to show up at work, like nothing's happening, right? You just got to produce, produce, produce. Like you were frustrated by, 
uh, a hustle culture that says we always got to keep going. Um, and that doesn't give us enough time to, um, it doesn't adequately express the importance of taking time for ourselves, self-care, things like that. Nobody should have to experience going things alone, right? No one should have to experience um, feeling a certain type of way. And then to demonstrate your competence, uh, this is of course really helpful on your website. If you have testimonials, uh, case studies, if you have a logo reel full of your past clients, if you have awards, um, this one, maybe on your LinkedIn headline, you know, if you have Forbes 40 under 40, that's a good thing to put there. That's a credibility marker. We just wanna get people to trust that we know what we're doing. So that's how we show up as the guy. All right, so our character, they wanted something, they got a problem, we showed up as the guide. Now we're gonna give them a plan to overcome that pain. The point of the plan is to lift the fog for our customers and our clients and our donors and to make it look really easy to work with us. Um, if you're solely a donation-based organization, maybe you are grant writing or something like that. You wanna make it look like you've got your process down like one, two, three. This is how we generate our impact. Right? We don't want it to look like, oh, well, if you give us your dollars or you give us this million dollar grant or whatever, wouldn't that be nice, right? If you give us this million dollar grant, um, we're gonna be doing like this stuff and this stuff and this stuff. And here's a story about that worked for some, you know, we wanna say, hey, it's gonna go step one, step two, step three. That's it, we got it down pat, right? My friend and mentor always says that, you know, our brains are wired to like not, burn calories if we don't have to. And so we don't want people to burn calories thinking about how to consume our product, um, how our service works. Like we don't want people to have to think about that. We wanna make it look real simple. So uh, there's, I think I re really recommend like two different ways of doing this. One is that what do people need to do to get started? Um, and so if you have sort of like an on-ramping process or something like that, that's a great plan to list out. So maybe I have a, a SaaS solution, software as a, a software as a service solution. So maybe the first thing is um, book a call with someone on our team. Step two, we will walk you through our live demo and three, uh, trial our product for seven days or whatever. Um, it could also be, you know, if you have online, people need to navigate some sort of online form or submit an application or do whatever. Um, that's a great way to say, here's how you get started. It's as easy as one, two, three. On the flip side of that is that um, after they purchase or after they donate, how are they gonna use that product or service? Or in the case of a donation, um, how, like where are those dollars gonna go? How are they gonna achieve that impact? Um, so maybe, you know, if you're a consultant, it's discovery strategy, execution, right? Something like that. Um, the point being, I, I think this is somewhat self-explanatory. We wanna lift the fog for our customers. Now, one thing I will say is I almost always get uh, some sort of pushback of like, oh, Zach, our business is too complicated for that. Our business is too big for that. We do too many things for that. Listen, I've, been, I've done this for long enough with enough people, every single business, every single nonprofit, whatever organization, whether you're a solopreneur or you've got a co-founder or you've got five employees or you're a 500 person corporation, you can break down what you do into three main steps. Now there might be a million sub steps, but again, we gotta make this look easy. So we give our hero a plan and now we say, go do something about it. What is the next step people need to take to do something about it, right? To become a customer, to become a client or a donor, what's the next step they need to take? Do they need to book a call? Do they need to donate now? Do they need to request a demo? Do they need to um, install now? Um, I just uh, connected with um, the CEO of Ripple Suicide Prevention. They're doing something really cool uh, where you install a plugin on Google Chrome and it kind of analyzes your search history and their um, interventions and stuff that happened with that. But their main thing is, like install, install it now. That's all you got to do, right? What's that very next step people need to do to work their way down the ladder? For those who aren't ready yet uh, to pick up the phone or to open their wallet and donate, what's something that they can do in the meantime? In the marketing world, we uh, like to say you should have a, a lead magnet. A lead magnet is just something that you give away for free in exchange for an email address. It can be a short value-packed PDF. It could be a video course, uh, maybe a five-day email course. It could be just any kind of resource that gives um, that gives your audience a lot of value and helps them overcome a problem quickly. That can be used as a lead magnet. 
Um, and just as, as an aside, everything that you do in your marketing should ultimately come down to getting people into a traffic source that you control. This, you know, like 95, 99% of the time means your email list. If you are building your audience on Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else, that's that's rented land, right? When Facebook starts squeezing out entrepreneurs, just like they did to bands and artists and creatives, and no one sees your stuff anymore. Uh, when organic reach and Instagram is gone overnight, like it is now. When Google changes its algorithm with updates, uh, you know, in the early 2010s, there was a Panda and Penguin and Hummingbird, I think were the big ones up to 2013, 2015. People lose their rankings overnight. No one's coming to their website. Their well dries up, they go out of business. With an email list, people are raising their hands and they are giving you permission to contact them directly. Of course, we don't want to spam people, right? We are going to um, show up again with adding a bunch of value and um, providing solutions to their problems and entertainment when necessary. We're just going to show them that they're there, um, that we're there rather. But that's something that you control. People can't take that away from you. Um, and it is your most highly engaged and most highly profitable uh, subset of people that you're ever going to have. McKinsey put out a study in 2015 that email was 40 times, not 40%, 40 times more effective at acquiring a new customer than Facebook and Twitter combined. This is 2015 when Facebook and Twitter were killing it for customer acquisition. I would argue that's not the case anymore. Um, email has not gone down at all. I get a lot of questions that are like, uh, for especially youth focused organizations, uh, you know, young people aren't using email like um, older generations and things like that. Listen, the empirical research shows that that's one, just not that true. And two, there's still no asset you're ever going to have in your business that um, is going to provide a 4.4 thousand percent return on your investment that's going to get more valuable over time. It's the last thing I'll say about the email list and I'll shut up, but this is so important, is that on the low end, every email subscriber you have should be worth about $1 per month in your business. So if you have 2,000 email subscribers, you should be generating on the low end about $2,000 a month for them. When you increase the value of that. Um, and when you get better at just email marketing and you know all the things that come with that, you can very easily get that to $5, $10 a person. Imagine if you had just 1,000 people on your email list, but you were able to generate $10,000 in revenue for donations every single month. What would that do for your business? Okay, so all that to say, that's why you should have a lead magnet or something that gets people onto your email uh, onto your email list. People don't want to sign up for another newsletter. Again, you've got to uh, tell them the benefit and what they're going to get out of it. So the direct the direct call to action: What are people? Uh, what, what's the next step that people need to take in order to become a customer, client, or donor? And what can they do in the meantime to get on your email list? Okay, when our hero takes that action, when they finally work with us, they engage with our business, they buy, they donate. First of all, they're going to avoid something uh, happening, right? People are motivated by loss aversion, right? Um, there's, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, these psychological, these clinical experiments of how people are more motivated to keep something that they're afraid to lose than to gain something that they don't already have. And so our business, our organization, we exist for a reason. The work that we do is essential. It's important. And so we need to tap into that and communicate that really clearly. What negative consequences are going to be avoided when you buy from us or you donate uh, to support our cause? What's the cost of not taking action? So if I never lose that last 20 pounds, so what? What's going to happen, right? If I never uh, fix the problems in my relationship, so what? What's going to happen? Right? If I have a problem where I don't know how to get clients in my business or something like that, and I never do, what is going to happen? Right? I'm not going to be in business for very long. So again, we're not pushing into people's negative emotions. We're not exploiting those negative emotions, but we are clearly communicating what is at stake. Why is this urgent? Again, we are in business for a reason. Make that reason clear. And if you can't, you know, more or less immediately tap into that. Um, that is an issue on the level of your mindset and your belief. And so the first thing I would recommend is um, spending some time just alone with a notebook, whatever, 
and uh, figuring out, okay, what are the beliefs I have around why we exist as an organization? What are the benefits that people get out of working with us? And even more importantly, if we stopped existing as an organization, why would that be a problem? Why do we have to keep uh, doing what we're doing? Why is it necessary? I was on the phone with uh, a nonprofit ED. They were planning a big donation campaign. And I said, what happens if you get $0 from this campaign? And she was like, well, we're on the last stretch of our budget. Like our organization is going to have to close. And I said, okay, so what? So what? There's, there's a lot of nonprofits out there. So what? If your organization disappears, uh, frankly, I'll go donate to a different one. Right? So you've got to really communicate. No, it is urgent that you donate to our nonprofit. It is uh, urgent that we continue to tackle this cause because there's going to be a huge void if we don't. We need to work together to solve this issue. Social entrepreneurs, so it's not just a donation-based uh, issue. Social entrepreneurs, you're selling a product for a specific reason. You're doing your service. Your, your, your business model is the way that it is for a specific reason. What is that? What are all the bad things that we are helping to overcome? What's that pain that we're helping people overcome? That's the failure. And of course, on the flip side of that, you're going to achieve success. When we avoid all that bad stuff, we're going to be getting a bunch of good stuff in return. What positive changes is your customer or client or donor going to experience after using your product or service? Like I said at the beginning with the identity transformation piece, why will someone hand you money and say, thank you? What will it look like for you to achieve your mission? Whether you're a nonprofit, social enterprise, anything else, right? We have a mission. We want to achieve some certain result. Here's a pro tip about your mission. A lot of nonprofit mission statements are horrible. Uh, we want to achieve X. Um, by X date, so that X result. That's the mission of our organization. What will it look like when that comes true? We exist to solve world hunger. What will it look like when there's not a single person on this planet who's hungry? What will it look like when the, the, the things that we are called to do for our community, the way that we are called to serve our community, what happens when we're successful? My uh, mentor, Peter Shallard, he's uh, often called the shrink for entrepreneurs as a trained psychologist. He always says, what are the side effects of success? Okay, I lose that last 20 pounds. I get a six pack, great. What are the side effects of that? I'm gonna be waking up with a whole lot more energy in the morning. I'm gonna feel good about my body, right? I'm probably gonna be um, investing in better foods that are healthier for my body and better for the environment. What are all the side effects that come from success? So jot down three here. So I know that was a lot. And if you uh, have stayed tracking with me, thanks. Let's put it all together. You get your reward. So this is something called a brand script. And uh, the purpose of this is just, you know, keep the starred in your Google Drive, hang up on the wall of your office, whatever. Uh, when you put all the pieces of the brand script together, you will never be in a position where you're like, what do we say? You're never going to have that issue of what to say, because we always know that we're going to communicate the problem that we solve, the solution, how it works, the happy ending, like how that makes the world uh, a better place, what people need to do. Right? The brand script is more than just uh, a script full of words. And obviously, it is that, and that is a very helpful tool, but it's also a way of thinking through our communications. It's a way of thinking through how do we, when we speak, when we present something on our website, when we post something on social media, how do we speak that in a way that gives people to lean in and listen and say, tell me more, that connects with them and says, I wanna find out more about that. How do we show up with this part of service? This brand script is the antidote for it. So what you're gonna do is just, if you've been following along at home with a worksheet that I recommended uh, in Google Drive, no worries, I'm gonna post another link to it at the end of the slide deck. It's totally free. You don't have to enter your email address or anything. Just go copy it um, and use it for yourself you will see that each question corresponds to a, part, uh, to a part of this brand script. Now, let me just read through it so you can get a sense of how this might sound um, for, um, and I really should have come up with, a, with an example and been prepared to use. Let's just use Denver Startup Week as an example. We could say something like, at Denver Startup Week, we know that you wanna be a successful world-changing entrepreneur. That's the identity transformation we wanna be. In order to do that, you need to surround yourself with people who are going to inspire you to learn, 
and get the connections you need, and et cetera, et cetera. You need to surround yourself with the community. The problem is you don't know where to look. And I mean, we're still in COVID. I mean, you can't, it's hard to gather. Where are you going to go for a community full of all this? That makes you feel isolated and alone. Maybe you don't feel like you have the knowledge or the resources um, to be able to do what you feel called to do. We believe that no one should have to go about the entrepreneurial journey alone. We understand how it feels um, to try to get a business off the ground and feel like you're doing it all alone. That's why we have cultivated the nation's first and freest uh, entrepreneurial event of its kind with Denver Startup Week. Want to get involved? Here's how. It's easy. Um, first, browse our schedule of free events all week and add them to your online schedule. Two, show up ready to learn and ready to network. And step three, um, make lasting connections that are going to skyrocket your success and give you a family for a lifetime. So sign up for Denver Startup Week today. And in the meantime, um, download our free PDF, The Seven Secrets of Highly Successful Startup Founders that they know, but you don't. <laughs> so you can stop walking down the path to broken, burned out. And instead, you can make the difference that you were called to make in this world. Okay, that was just off the top of the dome. Uh, imagine if you took some time and sat down with your team and called your customers and said, hey, how does this sound? Let me ask you some of these questions. What pain were you solving, right? This isn't just an armchair exercise. Get on the phone, talk to your customers, talk to your donors. Um, imagine if we took the time to amass all that and put it into this brand script and we always knew exactly how to deliver that story. Such a powerful tool. However, I want to take it a step further. This isn't just something that's going to send your Google Doc like, oh, that's great. I've got like a little story on my hands. There are, are immediate ways that you should be applying this brand script in your business um, to generate more and more results. The first thing I would do is uh, to develop something called a one-liner. It's like a mini elevator pitch, two to three sentences. So that someone says, what do you do? Or you need to have a short speaker bio, or you just need to like write a blurb somewhere. Um, you always have this one liner on hand. So for my business, uh, you know, something I could say is a lot of social entrepreneurs struggle to raise awareness, awareness for their business. Um, I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching for founders and executive directors that helps them uh, get the word out and grow the revenue. That way they can make the impact that they feel called to make. All right. If I'm in the back of an Uber, that's a lot better than saying, I am a consultant. <laughs> All right. I'm an entrepreneur. Oh. Cool. Tell me about your business. Uh, it's complicated. No, I have something intentional to say. Right? I believe that if your business is making it, my personal belief, that if your business is making the world a better place, then you have a moral obligation to do everything you can to get that in front of people so that they know about it. They have the opportunity to be invited into that story, to step into that story, and to experience that transformation for themselves. I believe that that's your obligation as an entrepreneur or a marketer or a nonprofit ED. And so having tools like a one-liner helps us deliver that with conviction. The second thing is a website. Uh, an effective website has five essential sections. It's a headline that calls out that identity transformation piece, um, a little section that talks about the problem you solve that corresponds to the problem and the failure section of the brand script. On the flip side of that, all the good things that happen as a result of working with you, that's the success section. Um, a plan section, how it works. Um, that's obviously the plan section. And then for lack of a better phrase, like a little explanatory paragraph. Um, that's where you can handle any last minute hesitations or objections. Um, you can put your one liner there, you can put a little video there, whatever is whatever people need to hear in order to get that last sense of connection with you to move forward. All of that, you know, you could redo your website. You don't need to redesign your website. Just it's a matter of changing up the words and communicating that story more clearly. When you have the brand script, you can do that in an hour. Wouldn't it be nice to like revamp your website and double your conversions in one hour? Seriously, that's like, that's the power of this. And I'm not just saying that. Um, this is stuff that I, I have seen personally with people that I work with and other people who use this tool. Um, of course, with your email list, I went on and on about how that was the most, most important asset in your business. Um, with your brand script, you'll always know how to position yourself, how to stretch out your uh, if you're using any kind of funnel, autoresponder sequence, or if it's just a single email, if it's your monthly newsletter, you know, whatever it is, 
you'll know how to position it in terms of um, here's the problem we're solving and here is a little slice of that solution, right? Again, this is a way of thinking through our communications. We are solving problems for people. If your emails do not add value to people, don't send it. Just delete it, do not send it, right? But when we are thinking through what our organization exists for and we have this vision, it's not hard to craft an email or craft a sequence um, that delivers a ton of value and gets people to, to trust in us. And of course, all of your traffic generation, all of your lead gen assets, your um, ad copy, your content, whether that's a blog post or uh, a YouTube channel or a podcast, your social media, um, you'll, again, you'll never be stuck in a sense of, I don't know what to say because everything is gonna come back to the message and the vision of our organization that's contained in the brand script. Ultimately, what you want to do is build a simple sales funnel that guides people from getting to your website, downloading your lead magnet, getting on your email address, and then becoming, with a follow-up funnel, becoming um, a paying customer, client, or donor. That's a topic for a different day. Super happy to chat about it. Um, if you do want to chat about that or anything else, here's what I advise doing next. First of all, download the brand script worksheet. Um, it really is just a simple tool that is going to make things so much easier for you. Uh, this is not something that needs to take you weeks of work. It's not even something that needs to take you hours upon hours of work, right? With the worksheet, it's just some questions that you answer. You can, again, call up your customers, clients, donors, and um, ask, ask them to answer these questions and you can get that voice of customer data right away. Um, so download that worksheet, that link is case sensitive. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. It's uh, Zach with an H. My last name is P-H-A-N-A-S-I-L-A-N-G. That's a G right there. K-U-L. I know with the line underneath, sometimes it looks like an O or an A. Maybe that's just because I took my glasses off, but uh, it's a G, K-U-L. Uh, what you can do there is in the feature section of my profile, you can download my free three-step social enterprise marketing blueprint. Um, you do have to enter your email address to get it. Um, that's just there. That's always there on my profile. No worries. If not, if that's useful to you, awesome. Um, the other thing is that message me for a free 30 minute call. Again, I was serious about it and I, I'm not going to try to sell you anything on this call. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that your branch for this is, is as good as it can be, uh, making sure that you know how to implement it. And then, I mean, if you just have any other questions about your marketing, this is a panel for nonprofits and for social entrepreneurs. I know we're all here because we're dedicated to making the world a better place. And like I mentioned, your time, your attention really is a gift to me. I'm stoked to be here. Uh, I feel like you've given me such a beautiful gift. And so I just want to give it back to you tenfold. This is my way of doing it. There's no sale attached to this. I just want to help you out. DM me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, that is that. I know that was a lot. So if you stay tracking with me and following along at home, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if there are any, I don't know if I can see the chat. I don't know if there's any questions. We want to launch this sort of Q&A. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to reach out to me for for a follow-up conversation. Uh, actually, do you know do you know where I can access the chat and see if there's anything anything in there? Yeah, yeah, I'm monitoring the chat. Um, I don't see any questions so far. Um, super helpful info. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead and submit them in the chat, and I can read them off. Oh, I see there's, uh, I didn't know this, there's a little other section called Q&A. So I want to ask, where's the three-step guide? Um, if you go to my LinkedIn profile and you scroll down to the featured section, um, there's just a big box there um, that I think it says three-step social enterprise marketing blueprint. Um, you can get that totally for free. It's just going to ask you to enter your email address. Um, that's where you can get it on my profile. Um, Zach, Kevin is asking, do you have an example worksheet already filled out that he can reference um i have brand scripts from clients that i work with which i wouldn't be super comfortable sharing i think that's a really good idea for um i think you just said kevin so kevin thank you for that suggestion um i think something that'd be great was just to think about uh, a social enterprise uh, or a nonprofit that might you know be universally relatable um and then filling it out that way. Uh, I think that's, a, I'm happy to share one that maybe I created from, from my own business as well, if that would help you. Um, so that's a great suggestion. Kevin, if you send me a message on LinkedIn or just in the chat or whatever, send me your email, um, I will do that for you and happy to send that your way. Thanks for the suggestion. 
I'm not sure if you can see the chat yet. There's a couple more questions that came up. Um, the next one, you mentioned newsletters were not helpful or they're overused, but email with helpful content is. Is this an extra click issue or too much content issue? That was a question um, from- Sure, let me clarify that. I don't think that newsletters aren't helpful. I think that newsletters are great. Uh, in my business, in my, in my previous business venture, uh, we frankly, we made money and made, you know, when I was leading an agency, our clients made money from newsletters. So I think that a newsletter is something that you should have. The thing that I think is not helpful is when you're on someone's website and it says, sign up for a newsletter. Oh man, I don't want another newsletter in my inbox. Okay. We get flooded with, I, I mean, there's the newsletters that I feel obligated to join. Then those are the ones I actually have to join. And between the two, I have 20,000 unread messages in my email. Um, and so what you need to do in all of your, this is something called opt-in copy. It's just the words um, around the form that get people to say, yeah, I want to enter my email address for that. If you don't yet have a lead magnet or a resource that you can offer for free in exchange for that email address, you could say something about what is, what's someone going to get in that email, uh, in that email newsletter, whether it's a monthly newsletter, a weekly newsletter, it doesn't matter what's in it for them. Um, James Clear, I think is great at this, uh, the author of Atomic Habits. Every Thursday, he sends out the three, two, one newsletter. It's three, uh, I think it's three ideas from him, two questions, and one, three ideas from him, two quotes, one question. Um, and, you know, he has some good language around it, how that is every, asking yourself these things every week is going to help you um, with your business. So, you know, maybe you could, you know, it's different for every organization. I'm happy to talk about it further because I know we're kind of running up on time here, but you've got to show what is the benefit of this newsletter. I think you should send a newsletter, but you've got to communicate the benefit. If, it, if it's not a valuable newsletter, don't send it. But make it valuable. Awesome. I think there is one last question in the Q and A um, from Dave. I don't know if you can see that, Zach. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I'll read it. Dave says our organization, like many, has multiple stakeholders with different needs, i.e., volunteers and program participants. Would you suggest creating multiple brand scripts or address each stakeholder's specific needs, or just one? Dave, great question. I get this question all the time. I can't believe I didn't address it. So. Um, Thank you for, for bringing this up. Um, yes, one thing, I would say you don't need more than one brand script, right? If you if your brand script can adequately capture the main thing that you're doing, um, you know, maybe if you, know, you have a nonprofit organization and you um, are just talking about your impact and that is enough for, for people to join the vision. What I would do after that is start breaking it down into subsets. So, to clarify, the first thing I would do is try to create a brand script that captures just the vision of your organization and the, the main reason that you're in business, the, the main core group of people you serve, et cetera. And then you can start breaking it down into different stakeholders. You can have a, um, I know something I did for a client was we had one brand script that was a mission brand script and then one, um, one brand script that was a donor transcript, right? We could ask the same questions. Who do our donors want to become? Why is it personally meaningful that they donate? Um, you know, why have they donated already? You know, what's their hesitation? What is the next thing that they need to know in order to open up their wallets and give? Um, this is especially the case for foundations and grants and um, people that are giving really large corporate gifts. You know, that's a large chunk of money that a lot of businesses don't give lightly. And so what is the thing that they What's standing in their way? What's their hesitation? And how can we show up with empathy and then with authority? Um, and having a brand script broken down like that can really help that. So yes, what I would recommend, one brand script for the vision, one brand script breaking it down, or multiple brand scripts breaking it down for each stakeholder um, in a lesser capacity, if that makes sense. I hope that was an adequate answer. Thanks, Dave. Great. Thanks so much, Zach. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, I did share a clickable link in the chat for the brand script. If anyone wants to access that really quick before we end the webinar. Um, but thank you all again for joining. Cool. Thanks, Ashley, and to everyone on the team. This has been a gift to me. So really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.